this morning. So if we go to our first slide of today, Proverbs chapter thir- uh, 3, verse 32 to 34, we start with the devious or the crooked person who is disgusting. So before we will go into the study today, we need to look at the Lord. We need to take a time and, and ask ourselves the questions, how do the Lord look at various people that we see described, the foolish, the mockers, the simple tongues, the lazy persons, the, the dishonest persons, the lying tongues? How do the, lo- the Lord look at these and how does he look at the upright, those who, who do their best to live uprightly? We need to know first, look at the Lord, l- look at how he feels, l- because the, y- y- you relate to him. So y- your life depends on that. Your faith is connected to the Lord. So we want to start there. So here we have it, something is disgusting to the Lord, or in many Bible versions, it is an abomination. It's, it's really horrible to, to the Lord. So, so that's what we see. But then he takes the upright, the righteous, and to his confidence. It's such a contrast. Amen? Amen. Look at the, this. The one is disgusted and the other one is like he brings you closer as a friend and intimacy. He allows you to, to know and learn things. You come into the close circle of the Lord. What? A tremendous privilege that it is. And please say amen to that. Because yeah. this, we, we need to be encouraged with something like that here. So the first uh, person that we find here, it, uh, we call the devious or the crooked. But actually the, the term here is the one who turn aside or depart from the path of righteousness. Because the book of Proverbs is a book written to the righteous. For righteous living, advice wisdom, uh, guidance to, for, for, the, for righteous living. So here, a person who has walked away, disregarded, despised this uh, advice of wisdom from the Lord. He's just departed from that. So we call the, we may say uh, crooked, and we see a sharp difference in how the Lord looks at these people. We see a strong accusation or declaration, an abomination. Wow, that's, a ba- that's very strong. We don't talk like that nowadays. Uh, we, we are quite tolerant and we try not, not to say what re- we really feel sometimes in anger or in disgust or something like this. It is loathsome or detestable to the Lord, repugnant to the Lord. But to the upright is brought into his confidence in an intimate council, this intimate circle of, of, uh, of friends and confidence, the secret council, a relationship. You are invited. You are privileged to have that type of relationship. Why? Because your way of life is pleasing to the Lord. You, you want to please the Lord. The fear of the Lord we explained last week is someone who trusts in the Lord, someone who wants to be right with the Lord, and someone who seeks to please the Lord in, in everyday life. And that's the everyday life that is. You know, you look at, at a couple who gets married. They, they are madly in love at the beginning. And then they start living. And then you start to feel some tensions and disputes, sometimes quarreling and things like that. What happened? Why do they dispute? Why do they quarrel? Sometimes it's not big things. It's most have to do with the little, tiny things of everyday life. And to the Lord, it's the same thing. We live our daily life under the the guidance, the blessings, and the, the eyes of the Lord. So he's looking at us. And it's very important to the Lord. Amen? So it's about relationship. What we see here, it's about relationship. Verse 33, we will come to that verse a little bit later, but again you see that this strong contrast, the curse upon the house of the wicked people and the blessing upon the home of the righteous people. Verse 34, emphasize again, the Lord is scornful because we know that in the book of Proverbs we have many mockers. 
people who don't care, people who raise their fears, they can see horrible things against the Lord. They just have no fear of the Lord at all. And they mock the, the things. And we know that in the last days there will be mockers also coming, mocking and scoffing. So the Lord scoffs. He also mocks. He, he's not you know, concerned with, with this kind of attitude. He knows the heart of man. So God is so bigger than that. But instead, he turns to us and he shows favor to the humble. Please say amen to that. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. So here we find, uh, again, we continue how the Lord looks at people. You find the same declaration, strong statement. The Lord detests the way of or the, life, the lifestyle of the wicked. But he loves him or her who pursue righteousness. Again, this strong uh, contrast. Love and abominations or disgusting or something like this. Those of crooked heart are an abomination to the Lord, but those of blameless ways are his delight. So you have love, delight, and contrasting with a feeling of disgust, of, you know, abomination. I don't like that. So the Lord is declaring to us this morning how he sees things. The one who turns away is here from hearing the law or God's teaching. Even if his prayer is an abomination. And then you will, you will wonder, in uh, verse 28, 9, Surely the prayer of someone who refused to listen to God's teaching is disgusting. In another way of reading the same, the same scriptures. Why do people who refuse to give their ears to the, the word of the Lord, who refuse to listen to God's teaching, would pray? Normally they wouldn't pray. They would completely go on living and ignoring. But you know, everybody, or I would say most of everybody, when they get in their crisis and their major crisis of their life, they suddenly remember how to pray. They forgot about it. They would not pray. But in the time of distress, in the worst time, they will say, Lord, if, at least if you are there, come. But what they, 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 they come, they, they still don't intend to change. So anyway, it's just to give you some ideas. We want to start with the Lord, how the Lord looks at people. Proverbs 21. You, who are the righteous, do what is right and fair, or practice justice and be fair in your dealing with any situations, with business, with people, uh, buying, selling, talking with people. Justice and fairness. That pleases the Lord more. You see, in the, there's a lot of a statement of better than or more than in the book of Proverbs. This is better than that. The Lord loves this one more than this one. So that pleases the Lord more than bringing him sacrifices. And the expression here that pleases the Lord more is something that is more acceptable, something that he embraces, something that he is looking for. It's more what he requires of people. It's better than religion. It's better than the praise service. It's better than offering that you can give. This is not a re uh, rejection of religion, but it has uh, uh, the statement that what you practice as religion are without value apart from righteous living. Because righteous living in the book of Proverbs is what is important in the eyes of the Lord. If you love the Lord, if you know the Lord, and it goes so much hand in hand with the New Testament. Read First John, Second John, Third John. It will see exactly the same statement. Whoever says that Jesus is in the light should walk in the light. Whoever says that he walks with Jesus should walk like Jesus walked. It's the same saying. It's the same teaching, basically. If you claim to be a Christian, you have to walk like a Christian. It's the same message as you find in the book of, of uh, Proverbs. So you practice justice and you are fair in your relationship. The Lord detests the sacrifice or the offering of the wicked, but he delights in the prayers of the upright. So here again the advantage is on our side. In other words, the spiritual conditions of the worshiper determines whether or not the worship is acceptable to God. It's not all to enter physically into a building. 
It's not all to declare ourselves like a, a, a believer or a Christian. Do you practice the life of the Christian? Or you come to the Lord, you may sing the songs, but if your heart is not to the Lord, will the Lord delight in the prayer? So maybe not, because it says here the spiritual conditions of the worshiper will determine how the worship will be accepted before God. Proverbs 15, 29, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. Okay, what does it mean? Because we know that God is love. It, 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 maybe it will give some problems to some of us this morning, because God is love. God has sent Jesus for everybody. So what does it mean that the Lord is not is far from the wicked. We know that the Lord is everywhere. We know that the Lord knows everything. So here we know that the Lord is not really far in terms of distance or in terms of knowledge of that person. But he is near to everyone and he would be ready to welcome anyone who would come to the cross and repentance. That is for sure. That's what we learn through all the Bible. But here we have, a, again, a statement of comparison, a, a statement of this is better than that. This is how the Lord looks at different situations. So the law is far from the wicked. So we need to understand what we are reading here. The Lord knows the heart of people. And here we're talking about the wicked person. The Lord knows that they are sinning and they are they don't care. They just don't care about sinning. They are not coming to the Lord and repentance. They are not ready yet. They have not been touched yet. They don't care. They ignore the warning of God's word. So the Lord, who knows the thoughts and the intents and the heart of people, when these people get into a crisis or in deep distress and cry out to God, he has positioned himself far from them. Not that he is not able to reach out and all, but that he takes a position because he's responding to the attitude because he knows. The, because the Lord knows they have no intention to change. You know, when you, the, you remember most of us before we were born again and we uh, became Christians and born again, when we would be in trouble, we would go to God, isn't it? Oh God, you know, save me from this uh, thing, you know. And, and we, we thought, you know, it's, it's really okay. But it's, it's not okay because the Lord says okay, they have no intention of changing their way. But to us, the greatest, one of the greatest benefits that we find in our righteous relationship with the Lord is being able to go to the Lord and pray. Think about it. You are welcome. You are being heard. God pays attention. He loves. He takes delights. Your worship is accepted. That's a big difference. You understand that? He is a God hearing and answering the prayers. And he is just there to bestow his blessing upon you. Do you believe that? Yes, I hope so, because it is in the Old Testament and it is in the New Testament. So closing with that, stage, uh, that uh, section this morning says, there is no question left in our hearts that it is extremely important to God that you and I walk in righteousness. Is there any question about that? I think it's clear, yeah? Oh, you're so quiet this morning? Yes? Yeah. Praise God. So there is hope for the unrighteous. I says, even though we said that the Lord is far, he is near when, the, when he knows that the heart is seeking God for a change, when the person will want to go to God at the cross and change his life and return to God, God will be very, very near to welcome. You draw near to God, God draws near to you. We read all of these things. So there is hope for the unrighteous because God is turning to them whenever they will be ready to go to Jesus. And if in this room this morning, you are still among the unrighteous, you have not made that step, God is there, is waiting for you. And if you have walked away from the Lord or failed the Lord, just put your trust in the Lord and the Lord will accept you again. Okay, let's move on this morning. And we are going to our topic, 
the Lord blesses the home of the righteous. It is the Lord who place blessings, who, who choose to put blessing. There is, to think about that there, we present here two houses, two homes. Maybe they are neighbors, we don't know. Uh, they are over there. Imagine the difference between what's going on and these two homes. Can you imagine? I think you have a good imagination this morning. The two home, the house of the wicked, do you think it's the same? The house of the wicked and the house of the righteous are the same? No, I don't think so. So in one home, God is ignored or worst. And in the other home, there is a place of worship. From that home, God hears prayers. He hears his word being read and paid attention to. He sees what's going on in this house. So God considers that house his own home. He makes home uh, there. He, he is comfortable. He goes and he lives there and he bless. Do you think that if God choose to be comfortable in your home, that your home will be blessed? Yes, thank you, thank you. And here when we says that, okay, we have some words that are difficult to sometimes discuss that we don't like to hear. The word curse, it's a big unpleasant word, curse. But to me, the easier way that I have to deal with the word curse is to do the opposite of the blessing or the absence of the blessing. Because we know that God is love and we know that it is God's loving hearts and intentions to, to bless, to bestow good things, to, to do good, to, to forgive, to accept and to, to bless. So there, are, there is a lifestyle. There are choices. There are things that people choose rather than the blessing of God and the friendship of God that will deprive them from the, the right and the blessing and the joy and the easiness. And the blessing here, we, it's like a, a gift, an enrichment. Like of God, if God is part of your life, there's an enrichment. You have someone strong, you have someone powerful, someone with resources on you and a favor. So one side you have blessing, you have gifts, you have enrichments, you have favor, you have God's presence with you. So that should be good. So God blessed the house of the righteous into two ways. I, I, I would simplify it in this way. The first is like a, a, a gift of grace. It's just like a, a pouring out of blessing. You did not do anything for it. You, you just are the recipient of the goodness of God. Have you ever experienced the goodness of God? For no, for no apparent reason, not that something that you deserve, something you have done, you have just have been blessed by the Lord. So that is one way that the Lord bless. And in the book of Proverbs, you will find, and we will give a series of advice later on, other, other way that we get the, the blessing of the Lord. It's like the Lord can bless you and your home by empowering you with the ability to succeed. He has Empower you to learn. Empower you to have an opportunity in your life. To, to, to get the, the right job, the right boss, the right atmosphere, the, the good schooling degrees. Or he has empowered you in a way to succeed materially and spiritually. That's God's. He has put that in your life. He has helped you to grow and to uh, these, these things in and, and your life. The ability to succeed in the material world and in the, your relationship with the Lord. That's how the Lord is able to bless us. If you look at the next verse, Proverbs 10, 3, the Lord will not let the righteous go hungry. Or if you look in the, the King James or a similar Bible version, the Lord will not allow the soul of the righteous to famish or to go hungry. So the Lord is not going to let you go in that this is situation here. And when it, we read about the, the soul of the righteous, that includes also the desire of the righteous. You know what is good with the book of Proverbs is sometimes when you want to understand the meaning of that part of the sentence, you compare it with the next part, the following part. And then it says, he refused to satisfy the craving or the evil desire. So you compare that sentence 
with this one here, like the soul of the righteous, the desire of the righteous. What the, the, you know, in the New Testament, Jesus says that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be satisfied. Is that right? That's an exact statement of this. Whatever the righteous hunger for and look for and a desire in their life, God is turning to them and says, I'm not going to let you famish on that. That is your righteous desire. You, you are hung, hungry for that. I'm not la letting you. And at that uh, verse here, you see a negative expression to emphasize a positive action of God. God will not allow you to wait or to, 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 to be famished and your desire for, for something from God, God will intervene. He will certainly satisfy you. Uh, Proverbs 13, 21. The righteous are rewarded with good. Amen? Amen? And the word good here is kind of a very wide and generous uh, general uh, term that includes both things and people. You know, you and I in our relationship as Christians and as we go on living our lives in the world, at job and schools you know, and everything, we meet a lot of people. And a lot of people can be a source of blessing, a good influence, a help, uh, or they could bring a lot of trouble and, you know, horrible things can come. So here it says that the righteous are rewarded with good. And the word good uh, um, includes something that is the best, better than, something that is pleasant, something that is precious, and it is often translated in many Bible versions with prosperity. The Lord re uh, reward the righteous with prosperity, with something that is good. He will bring good people, good resources. He will bring something good into your life when you need it. Uh, it could be um, riches. It could be anything. It can be different types of blessing because there's not only material blessing that are good to receive from the Lord. Last week, remember, we, we closed our message. We ended up with talking about Proverbs 15, 6. In the house of the righteous is abundant wealth. And we talk about, okay, what is wealth? We discuss about it. So I just want to review a little bit uh, this concept of the house of the righteous is, uh, is abundant wealth. The word wealth, prosperity, getting rich, or whatever it is, uh, is the word, uh, includes riches, strength, or power, or renewed energy, ability, or something, and treasure. And we talked about what is treasure, what is precious, and to your, your household last week. And it is also an accumulation of these good things that God brings into your life. I don't know if you remember, but me, I, I, I remember that in the past, I was really poor. And the Lord has progressively given me increase. N not because I'm smart, not because, you know, I did something, something. I, I know that the Lord has blessed, uh, blessed me with some sorts of accumulations over here. So I just want to bring in the, at this moment the, the concept of prosperity because it's often uh, we go to different, uh, we are uncomfortable with the word curse, but many Christians we are also uncomfortable with the word prosperity because we know there's so much uh, doctrines about and extremes about this. Good people, the righteous, are rich in many ways. So let me ask you the question. Does the book of Proverbs promise prosperity to the righteous? Is that an absolute promise? Aha. Uh -huh. Let me answer that. I know that it is a desire, but we will talk about that. The term prosperity is like a storehouse where that accumulates good things, okay? R Proverb 8.21, another very strong and positive statement. I, wisdom, if you follow the wisdom of the Lord, I may cause those who love me, I love wisdom, I'm seeking for the wisdom of God, to inherit what? Wealth. wealth 
and that I may fill their treasuries. Same thing again. We find the same same concept over here. So let's uh, c uh, clear up some misconceptions about prosperity. Amen. Let's talk about the gospel prosperity or the prosperity gospel. Is there a difference between the two? I think just by the writing it like this, it's already helpful to understand and see the difference. Is there a gospel prosperity and mentioned in the Bible and encouraged? That is a, a normal way or a suggested way by the scriptures that this is happening to the righteous. Is there? With goodness, with confidence, say yes. <laughs> now I'm confusing you, huh? Okay, uh, the prosperity gospel, what comes first? What word comes first? Prosperity. To the cost of compromising the gospel. We seek prosperity. We try to obtain prosperity. We are coveting prosperity. We are putting it first in our uh, priority list then we most likely will follow easily if I'll pray to the prosperity gospel messages. It will be appealing to us because it, it draws us. But then you have the other uh, expression here, gospel prosperity. What comes first? The gospel. Does, okay, is it suggested and the Old Testament and the New Testament by following Christ, following and trusting the promises of God, that there will be a prosperity following. <laughs> yes or no? Yes. yes, there is. You follow God. You will seek for wisdom. You want to live the righteous life. You work hard. You save your money. You manage your money. There should be normally increase. Yes? Okay, so we agree on that. So prosperity gospel, put prosperity before the gospel and seek prosperity above all else. Gospel prosperity, put the gospel first and accept the blessing from the Lord, the spiritual and the material blessing as an overflow of the gospel of a Christ-centered living. Is that, is that said properly? Yes? Okay, thank you. If you don't, then listen to the tape next week. Uh, okay. Most Christians are very much interested to hear about prosperity. And with good reason. Because it is presented often in the scriptures as a blessing from the Lord. So we should not be afraid of that word and stay away from it. Okay? We'll explain a little bit more. But as I was preparing this message... I also found a document, and I, it got me really interested. It's a document that goes through the book of Proverbs examining poverty and prosperity. And that is a fascinating subject, both of them, because we only want to study prosperity. But there is a lot of scriptures about poverty. Why poverty? What are the common causes? Uh, wh what is the, the disadvantage of living in poverty? And uh, you know, all, all sorts of things coming out, explaining the words used, how God uh, talks about it. And do you know that the poor and the rich have something in common? In the book of Proverbs, both are created by the Lord. So poverty exists and prosperity exists exist as well and God is okay with with all of that and he's working and he's giving us wisdom to live and he's giving us some uh, rewards and encouragement to seek after him you know God knows that after human being fell into sin all of our understanding of the world all of our world uh, view uh, world view of, the, of uh, everything is kind of perverted by sin it's been corrupted by society, by educations, by, by lifestyle, by, by modern living and everything. So uh, we, we are a little bit distorted uh, understanding of what's important in, in life. So God knows that let me encourage people to search for me. 
I will give them some encouragement by giving them promise that if they search for me, they will find long life. They will find righteousness. They will find honor. They will find riches. Their life will be improving by just searching for me. God wants us to find him. It's not that the goal is not the, that we will, the goal of God is not that you become rich. The goal of God is that you find God and that you find uh, joy and, and, and friends uh, and God. And while you are doing that, the outflow of your relationship with God will be a lot of good things that should be happening in your life. Okay, now let me go a little bit further with that, that concept. I ask you a question and some of you answered in a way and I, and I says, does the book of Proverbs uh, um, promise prosperity? And is, is it an absolute promise? And some of you said yes. Let me say something when we, for biblical interpretation of the book of Proverbs. That's very important for uh, the poetical uh, literature in the Bible. We know that the biblical Proverbs have a higher level of wisdom. They, they offer us the wisdom of God. But for sure, we cannot interpret these, all of these sayings that we, we've said. Let me go back. Um, will be filled with treasures. We, we cannot really look at that as absolute promise and just quote it, you know. We can put it in a prayer. You can ask God to lead you in this way. But this is not, if you do this, you will get that in an absolute manner. That's not how we should interpret the book. They are not promised by God that if you do certain things, it will correspond always to the result. If you do this, you will always and only and absolutely get rich. Is that true? If you look at life, if you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, if you look at the book of Job, if you look at the prophet Jeremiah, is that automatic that if you live a righteous life, you will have no problem at all in the rest of your life? Okay, so there we go. We go somewhere. We go somewhere. Okay. They are general truths about how life should work for the righteous, how the, the, the righteous should, should live. Okay, let me say something more on that. These expressions of general truths have exceptions due to, uh, this is John McCartney who says, says that, these expressions of general truth that we read in the book of Proverbs have ex exceptions due to the uncertainty of life. Do you agree with that? And due to the unpredictable behavior of fallen man. God does not guarantee absolute universal outcome application for each proverb. But by studying these proverbs, you will come to understand the mind of God. You will come to understand more of his character, his attributes, and his blessing. But they are not statement of promise, but general statement. John Scott Duval and John Daniel Hayes uh, put it in their books. Proverbs are not uh, uh, presents the rational norms of life. Uh, the ma many proverbs are not things that are always true in every case, but they, they are things that are normally true. Do you see the difference? They are not things that are always true, but they are things that are normally true. For instance, if you work hard, you will prosper. That's normally true. Is that true? Yes? yes. If you don't work hard, you will be poor. Is that right? Yes. Okay, if you're lazy, okay? That's generally true, is that? Uh, wise, righteous, hardworking people can expect a blessing, a prosperous life, while foolish, sinful, lazy people can expect a hard life. Generally true? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, these things are normally true, okay? So 
Pre Proverb presents to us a wisdom for the righteous to live by and to relate to God. Because we, we read at the openings, many scriptures, how God looks at the righteous and the wicked, and the lying tongues and the lazy and all this. It's all So God has a way to look at people. Okay. Life does not always work that way. We find it in the book of Job, Ecclesiastes, and, and this way. An example. He who tills his land will have plenty of bread. Yes? yes? But he who pursues worthless things lacks sense. This means that the person who works hard and is productive in his work will be able to provide for his needs while the person who wastes his efforts and frivolous or foolish uh, activities will not. This is generally true. Yes? yes. Okay? It is a good principle to live, die, to live by. But it does not mean that, pay attention to that, that every man, every poor man is a lazy fool. Does that mean that? Oh, no, uh, am I losing you? <laughs> okay. He who tills his land will have plenty of bread, but he who pursues worthless things lacks sense. Normally, it is true. You will improve your life. This is generally true. But does it mean that every poor man is a lazy fool? No. no. Okay, so there we go somewhere. And does that mean that every prosperous man is a diligent man and honest and everything. No, not also, so it's not always. There could be a flood. There could be, uh, I was watching TV last, last week and I was really touched. I think many, uh, probably many of you have seen the same, same scene. This poor man in the southern, western part of India who are flooded was on a, on a bridge and he was pointing on the water. He says, this is my house. But you couldn't see a house. Of course, it's only water. And his only tool to earn was a, a sewing shoes, like a machine to repair shoes. It was there. And he was crying. So is he a, is, is he a fool? No, he's not a fool. Was he working hard? Yes. yes. So. That's what we mean by saying that the principles that we read in the book of Proverbs are the way to go. They are the general way of prosperity, but not always. There are exceptions to that. That's important for us to be balanced. You know, in Lighthouse, we always try to bring, uh, since the, the foundation, an honest view, balanced, truthful teaching of the Bible. If we don't do that, then... We better quit our job, <laughs> go somewhere, somewhere else, okay? Thieves may come and steal. I was watching on TV again in Madagascar. You know, how many of you loves, loves uh, vanilla? Vanilla is like gold. It's so expensive. Vanilla, I think, is either the most expensive uh, things uh, or saffron. Saffron and vanilla, they are both like gold. <coughs> Saffron, yeah, from uh, Turkish, like a little uh, uh, spice or something, yeah. Okay, so this farmer in Madagascar is cultivating vanilla, and because it's uh, so much value, there's so much poverty in the country, and the price has increased so much, that now he has to sleep in his forest of vanilla tree with his gun to protect because people come just at before harvest time and they harvest all the vanilla to take it away from him. So Proverbs is true, but we live in a sinful world of unfair and unjust things. So it's the wisest course of action but things are, come out of our control sometimes. Uh, so anyway, uh, you understand what I'm talking about. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> let's move on.
Okay, four principles here how you may reach uh, the blessing of God, attain the blessing of God, and how you may experience prosperity and success in your life. You may expect that, except the exceptions that we mentioned before. If you live in this way, if you practice wisdom, you seek wisdom, you walk with God, you should see a lot of these extraordinary results just being the outflow of your life. Amen? Amen? Yes? You are not sure. Please tell me that you are sure. Yes. Okay. The first one is never use wickedness to obtain wealth. Don't put it first in your life. Fear the Lord is more important. Number two, work hard and plan well. Number three, be generous with all you have and pay your tithes. For number four, pursue wisdom and trust the Lord in every way. If you do that, you should expect prosperity in your life. You believe that? Amen. Now, convince me that you believe that. Amen. Okay, okay, because I'm not sure. Okay. So, number one, never use wickedness to obtain wealth. Proverbs 10.2, wealth describes as a blessing from the Lord. If it, if it is the Lord that is going to bless you, then don't use deceit. Don't try it on your own. Don't try to make it. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't use dishonesty. This is not the blessing of the Lord if you increase in this way. Wealth can only be a blessing under certain circumstances. Proverbs 21, 6, wealth created by the lying tongue is a vanishing mist and a deadly trap. Anyway, we could explain it more, but I will go a bit fa faster on that. Proverbs 10, 22, the blessing of the Lord, that's the, what we are looking for, makes a person rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. Okay, what does that mean? Makes rich, brings accumulation, it increase. Any, and okay, there's different interpretation, different Bible version, quote this, the scriptures uh, different, and he adds no sorrow to it. Sometimes they will say, and toil, or all, all your efforts and all of your work will have nothing to do with it. It doesn't add. If the blessing comes from the Lord, it doesn't come from you. It doesn't come from your really effort. There's another form of blessing. I, I said before, there's a blessing that comes out of your saving, your wise, and your, your, your hard work, and your perseverance, and all this. There is a, also a form of blessing from God. But the blessing that comes from the Lord that is just poured over you out of grace, you, you don't need to work. And it doesn't bring sorrow. Uh, it doesn't make you more tired at night. It doesn't affect your life. And it's not uh, like the, the, the wealth that comes from cheating and lying. It will bring sorrow. It will bring uh, uh, turmoil uh, in your life. Uh, we talked about it last week. So sorrow is not an ingredient of God's blessing. Okay, number two. Work hard and plan well. The, this, there is desirable treasure or a storehouse to be desired. A storehouse with things that are to be desired. Good things like uh, expensive things. Uh, things that are uh, good that we desire about these things. There is desirable treasures in olive oil. Uh, olive oil is, uh, the word olive is not there, or oil. Uh, and it also could be fatness, because many times in Proverbs, uh, riches increase, prosperity is also grow fat. Uh, y y it, get, it gets big, so you, you receive these things. And the dwelling of the house. There is desirable treasures and oil or fatness in the dwelling of the wise, but the foolish person devour all he has. Here there is a, a, a principle of saving, a principle of managing your finance. Okay, there is an accumulation. You work, you earn a salary, you, you get something out of your efforts. So there's already there, there's an increase. But of course, you need to pay your bill as well, okay? So then you lose your money. Then you need to work longer and all this. But if you save your money and you manage your money well, there will be a st accumulated 
amount of good things in, you, in the store of your house. In Canada, I think it makes sense for us because all of our homes have a basement. And I remember when I had a garden before we were, my children were very, very young, Bridget, we had a big, big garden, we were poor and we, we saved a lot of the cabbage and carrots and potatoes and things like this. And we had a sand, a, a sand box in the basement where it was cold and we would put our carrots and our potatoes and our cabbage in the sand and during winter it would stay just good perfect temperature then when we wanted carrots would go to the basement in the storehouse and then we would get good carrots from our garden throughout the winter and things like this so so it makes it makes a, uh, it makes sense here's like the saving and the wise managing of the things that you accumulate through normal living with God, the blessing of the Lord will accumulate and then you will get. But look at the fool. He divorces all that he has. Spend money. The check comes, spent. Get something, spent. Credit, get it on credit. Not enough salary, spent, spend, spend, spend. And no saving. So that's the difference that we see here. Work hard plan well. A slack hand and a hand of the diligence we have in the following verse. Slack and a lazy hand and the diligent hands makes rich and the other one brings poverty. It's so simple. It's so natural. It's almost childish. Too simplistic as a, as a way of life. But God writes it. The Holy Spirit wants you and me to pay attention to that. You, you have lazy hands, that's what happened. You have diligent hands, you will get something more. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Here, uh, uh, one little uh, detail here I noticed. In the previous sections, we says the blessing of the Lord makes rich. Here we read, the hand of the diligent makes rich. So there's again the two, the two side by side uh, blessing of the Lord. One is the Lord who bless your household because he takes delight. You, you live for him and you, you stay close, you seek after him. And the other one is just like you practice righteous living. And by being intelligent and in your way of life, you get more of something. Number three, be generous with all you have and pay your tithes. Do you pay your tithes? Yes. All of you. Aha. Okay, listen, it's in the Bible. Bring it to the, the storehouse. Bring everything. Bring first, the first fruit. Bring to the Lord. I'm not the one saying that. I'm, I'm, I'm in the Proverbs. Next, next time I will have another uh, topic in the book of Proverbs. That's the topic today that I have. It's a scripture. I did not write this. God write these scriptures. Honor the Lord from your substance. The word substance is like the things that you have. The things that you have enough acc in accumulations. You have received something and from the first fruit of all of your crops. Okay, let, let me shock you. You know, some of you don't like to don't like to be disturbed with paying your tithes and giving to the Lord. Uh, let me make see something horrifying. Okay, <laughs> then you can you can take it or leave it. Okay, I'm not the one saying it. This is from a theologian of the past. This is in the Bible commentary on that scriptures. Can I read to you what he says? Okay. So if you are angry, then this way you're not angry at me, angry at him. <laughs> okay. Whatever secular prosperity God sent us, the first portion belongs to God. Amen. And there should be other portion of it, always for the poor and for God's cause. Not only the tithes, but any things, any opportunities, any opportunities. Okay. Now, be careful, that's the dangerous part. Serious too. <laughs> Hold on to your chair. <laughs> when that portion is given, the rest is sanctified. 
you have given your share to the Lord, all of your money, your wealth, your storehouse is sanctified. God is over that, is glorified, and is blessing even more. Okay? But be careful. When it is withheld, God's curse is upon it. I told you. <laughs> Serious stuff. You give it to the Lord, you give you 10%, the, your 90% is blessed. You withheld the 10%, your 100% is cursed. Look at the book of Agai. People were, were living for themselves, building their house, getting rich, and all of these things. And they were working, and the prophet came and says, you are receiving salaries and pockets that have holes. It just runs through. I could give you many, many uh, examples of that. Uh, in my in my life and people surrounding me. Anyway, I just wanted to read that to you because when I read that yesterday, I says, should I read this to the church tomorrow or not? Do you think do, do you think I should read it? Yes. Okay, give to the poor, give to God, and God will give to you. Basically, that's what he says. The word uh, honor here is a command. We can honor the lordship of Christ with how we manage our possession. No, that's not the quote, no. This is something else. I finished the quote, okay? Quote. Everything we have belongs to the Lord. We are managers. It is our privilege to choose to live modestly and to trust God with our future. Look at how awesome the promise is in verse 10. Look at the promise. God wants to encourage you to trust him. Your barns, that's more than your little uh, sandbox in the basement like I was talking about. It's a barn. It's big. How many of you have worked on farms before in barns? I, my, my uncle, my grandfather had big farms. When it was hay season and the, the school was finished, our parents would ship us to the farm and we would be working hard. And it was hard work. The barns were big. And here the barns will be filled completely and your vats will overflow with new wine. With new wine. From the first fruits, this expression refers to practice the giving to God the first and the best portion of the harvest. That's what it means. I'm not making it up. The first and the best of everything goes to God. That's the principle of the people of Israel. The Levites have been given to the Lord as a tithe for all the tribes of Israel. When they came into the new land, the promised land, they had to uh, uh, give these cities, the spoils, everything devoted completely to the Lord. The first to the Lord. That's a principle, Old Testament, New Testament, it's e everything. God wants the first part. Okay, let me ask you a question. Why is it important to give the first part of our income? The first part, the best. Like, why, why is it important to you? I'm talking to, to you, to the benefit. I'm not, okay, let me explain to you something this morning. I'm not trying to get your money. You understand that? I'm not trying that. I'm reading something in which God, who provides wisdom to those who fear him, will trust him and put that general principle in practice. And the outflow of your trust in the Lord and practicing it will bring more blessing over your life. That, that's, that's why we are doing that. Please believe me generous person will be enriched and the one who provides water for others will be himself satisfied. That is what we do. When we come to you and says, okay, we have a project, we would like to invest, we provide to you, uh, this, is, this is what we believe, okay? We provide to you an opportunity to participate into a way that you will want to 
never pressures, we have never pressured you to provide water for others. That you are believing that and the expression of that scripture is here, the generous person will be enriched is the soul of blessing. Go to the, 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 the word, uh, Greek word or uh, Hebrew word, the soul of blessing, the cheerful giver, the liberal uh, giver, the one who gives gifts and special flavor and takes pleasure in that. Do you have people around you who are so thoughtful? They will come to you and they, they bless you with something. They think of something. They, they give you a piece of cake, a piece of bread, or a gift, a box of chocolate, or whatever it is that people give to, to just be kind and just tell, tell you that they love you or they've been thinking of you some uncle or uh, family members or, or just brothers and sisters. That is what we do here in Lighthouse. We believe that. I have experienced that. Pastor Jennifer and many of you have experienced that. So, but we know that if we have a, a financial difficulty in Lighthouse, it's because some of you, or maybe you are new in the church or something, or for whatever reason, you with the first fruit of your income. You are not giving it to the Lord. And you have not learned the joy and the, the joy of sowing blessings into the kingdom of God. You have not experienced that joy yet. And we would like you to learn, that is our principle number three, that if you want to uh, experience the, the, the normal uh, outflow of living for God, we need to learn these things. It's, it's part of the package that comes by living a righteous life. Uh, okay? I talk already too much about it. Okay? <laughs> and my time is gone. And I cannot do number four. But anyway, we'll do it another time. Pursue wisdom and trust the Lord always. You know, in all the book of Proverbs, what is the most important Trust in the Lord. That's 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 the, the message of the book of Proverbs.